So, Beto, how are you, man? I'm doing great, David. How are you? Fine. Yeah, another another day, another morning in Mexico City. Another episode in English. So that's yeah. a clue for, for the audience that our guest is going to be international again. International, yeah, actually. <laughs> so, Beto, why don't... Uh, please introduce the, the guest of this episode, Paul. Yeah, uh, sure. Today we have a, a very special guest. Uh, all of our guests are, are special to us, but um, now we have a, a guest that has a, a unique style in in his YouTube channel and, and the way he, he, he tells stories and obviously the way he photographs uh, uh, people and, and do portraits. Uh, his name is, is Brian Burks. He's from San Luis, Missouri, and he's right here with us. Brian, <laughs> thanks for your time, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Brian. Oh, thank you. So, Brian, uh, we want to talk about, uh, obviously, your work and everything. But first, uh, tell us, who who is Brian and, and what Brian does? I know it's a hard question to start with. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was watching your guys' interview with uh, Ben, and he was like... <laughs> freaking yeah. out about who has been existential question, but, yeah. um, so I am, my main job, my full-time job is a wedding videographer. I've okay. been doing that for, um, going on seven years now, like five years full-time, but, um, I started that out of college and it was pretty much all video up until two years ago. And I found uh, photography, film photography, more specifically. And I've been doing that for about two years now. Um, started the YouTube channel two years ago, and it's been going pretty good. I'm still doing wedding videos for my main money, but I'm starting to make a little bit of income with photography as well, so that's nice. But um, now I'm here talking to you guys. So <laughs> That's great. And Brian, how yeah. this passion for photography start? Um, I get, I mean, I've always liked capturing moments, I guess, but most of the time it was on video and I always had like a video camera, like an old, um, like tape camera, VHS, whatever. But, um, yeah. I got into video and I went to school for TV and film and mm. that didn't really do much for me because I didn't really, <laughs> I, At the time, I was like, I'm going to learn all this and then I'm just going to like apply for a job and I'll get a job and then I'll be like set for my whole life. But everyone knows that doesn't really work out that way all the time. So yeah. I uh, got my degree and I was kind of like lost on what to do. I was applying to jobs, not getting any jobs or interviews. And uh, my friend, at my best friend at the time, uh, his name's Josh, uh, we filmed a wedding together for my friend and then um we started that but yeah always been passionate about just capturing moments and stuff and i kind of always looked down on photography because i you're gonna notice this a lot i used to be like an idiot about a lot of things so <laughs> uh i used to look down on photography because i thought it was easy i'm, I'm doing video it's a lot harder um, yeah There's, there's a lot more things to it, yeah. but as I got into photography, I quickly learned that it's not the case and it's very hard to, uh, elicit any type of emotion with photography. So that's where it all started, but, um, mostly interested in photography now and the wedding business is kind of just, uh, just income and a business right now. Fantastic. Yeah. I've, I've been there in, in, in. Uh, wedding uh, videography it, it is hard it is a, it, it should be a sport man because <laughs> you get like I don't know I don't know how, how weddings are uh, how long weddings are wedding days are in, in 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 the US but here in Mexico is like 12 or 13 hours of, of yeah. doing video and and that is hard yeah they can they can get that long but it's usually just i don't know like what you're like the the bride prep and all that stuff but yeah yeah usually it's starting like at probably 10 a.m going until 10 p.m it's just 
a lot of running around and making sure you don't miss anything. And yeah, but once you do it a couple times, it gets a lot easier. So yeah, you get to know the 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 whole reach well, but you have to think about lighting, focusing, um, audio. It is it is hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. photography is also hard because you have you you only have one shot for for exactly for a way to 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 say it um i mean i respect uh, both of of the 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 job the processes of, of video and photography are, are very different i respect mm -hmm. both of them and each of one each one of them has his his challenges and yeah. I, i think it is great to be in video and in photography because right now you have to do everything you have to do like everything video editing uh post production motion graphics like you have to be a a, a swiss swiss army uh knife. <laughs> i was gonna let the knife yeah yeah it, it helps out a lot too if you do both because on the day of the wedding then you know if you're a videographer you know what the photographer needs if you're a photographer you know what the videographer needs but our style is like very laid back so we just we don't really like pose or anything we just try to let things happen And I feel like that's kind of how it translated over into my photography and my YouTube videos as well. But yeah, I learned a lot from doing weddings and that's kind of why it started the whole YouTube thing. Because I kind of had a leg up on uh, everyone in the video department, I guess. Yeah. And also when you are doing a wedding for a photography or video, you have to be very, very uh, conscious that that is a big moment for that people. So mm -hmm. if you mess with something, you will mess with with something important. So I I've been there and I miss a photo of the uh, for a uh, right prep. So mm -hmm. when when my my boss at, at the moment told me where is that photo when he when she put that thing on the in the hand, and I was oh my god oh, I, man. I miss it <laughs> I miss it. So you have to be very very responsible with this mm -hmm. kind of topics and and that moment that day because it's a very important day mm -hmm. yeah you you quickly learn um <laughs> <laughs> it yeah it, it i've made those mistakes i've missed things i've even just last weekend we uh we were working a wedding and we misplaced the audio recorder that we record speeches with oh, and yeah. we left it there and the dj had it And we asked him to like keep it in a safe spot, and I go back to the venue and it's magically disappeared. So, uh, still making mistakes, but that's how you learn. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, man, that that's a bad one. I mean, audio was always it because that that's the way you do it. You just let the the recorder in place and and you yeah. just keep on on shooting video and and you're not like actively monitoring that audio and, and everything could happen that that is mm -hmm. the, uh, a huge concern always um brian but doing video of obviously in, in digital how did you get into analog photography so i guess i was on reddit at the time and i'm still on reddit but it's reddit's a whole different ball game now, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. I was on there and I was just on a photography subreddit, just looking at different cameras, different pictures, things like that. And I came across a photo that was taken on a, a Fuji six by nine camera. And <laughs> at the time I had no, and it was a, of a classic car, uh, of course, but of course, <laughs> uh, yeah. I had no idea what analog photography was like I knew about film and stuff but um, I started reading the comments and people were talking about like medium format and all this stuff stuff I didn't un understand and it was shot on Cinestill 800T and I didn't know what that was yeah so from there I just started uh, looking at film stuff and I found like Willem Verbeek and Matt Day and all the legends of YouTube and started watching their videos just quickly fell in love with it and um, I bought my first camera was a Mamiya 645 I just skipped 35 millimeter for some reason I don't know why yeah. but uh, bought that around two years ago 
and that's kind of how I got into everything and uh, quickly wanted to just keep stepping it up and shoot in medium format and six by seven and now we're at four by five so it's kind of where it all got started yeah actually that's that's something that we we found on your work on your Instagram feed and and all your work on your videos also that you don't shoot on 35 millimeters so that's 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 cool because not everybody goes to medium format right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so I bought uh, the 645 and then uh, my girlfriend's grandpa, he actually gifted me a, an Olympus OM-1 or OM-2. I can't okay. remember, but I shot that a couple times and it wasn't that bad, but I scanned all of my own film and stuff. So it got to be a pain like scanning in 35 millimeter yeah. And uh, I was already pretty slow with my, like, I didn't shoot that much. So it just took me a long time to finish a roll of 35 millimeters. So I just find it a lot easier to shoot a larger format and just not shoot as much. If I'm going to shoot a ton of photos, I'm just probably going to use digital. Of course, yeah. And actually, talking about uh, formats, you shoot on four by five. How is that experience? Do you know? I I love four by five. Um, a lot of people. I I, well, I just fell in love with the look of four yeah. by five because, um, like I would see the work of Brian Scootmont, people like that, like Joel Sternfeld, shooting larger formats, and that's a lot of the reason why I even shoot four by five is just the, the look and feel of it. And I think if I was like shooting more landscape type stuff, I would probably just get a digital camera for that. Cause it'd be a lot easier and it'd be a lot lighter, <laughs> but for portraits and just interacting with people, I feel like you can't really beat the experience of using a four by five or a field camera. Um, it just brings, brings about, uh, an easiness to people and conversations and it just makes them a little um, just makes them ask questions and it kind of loosens them up a little bit and it just helps a lot when you're using that for uh, portraits specifically of people that you you don't know yeah you just just answered a, a question we we wanted to uh, to ask you that do, do you think it's easier to photograph strangers with a film camera and, and even a, a large format camera? And obviously, obviously, yes, because, I mean, they are the ones that, that start asking questions, as you, as you said. It, it's like a, a icebreaker in an, in, a, in, a, in an instant, right? Yeah, well, because most of the time how I shoot, I don't, when I ask people for portraits, I don't have my camera on me. So uh, okay. of course, of course, they're when I first asked, they're probably thinking that I'm just gonna like whip out a digital camera and like <laughs> like your uh, your, your iPhone or something. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> so I, I always explain to them, I'm like, I use a a big like slower film camera. It's made of wood, and you can tell like right away that they're just like, oh, that's interesting. But I like go out and get it, and every time I set it up, they're always just talking about how cool it is and it just immediately opens them up and uh, just kind of makes them at ease around you. And I've even like just walking around, if I have it like on the tripod, um, like folded out and everything, and I just like throw it over my shoulder, people are like always coming up and asking me just if I'm walking down the street with it, like, I just think it, it brings about different conversations when you're walking around yeah. with a digital digital camera. People might think that you're like um, doing something bad or like <laughs> taking pic like secretly taking pictures. But if you're walking around with a four by five film camera, people are like they they think that you're you're more important or maybe a more more of a professional than you are. So it just helps um, <laughs> in that department too. They think that you're taking this very serious, and yeah. they look at you like a. I don't know, uh, a special character is walking down the street. Something right. Like <laughs> yeah. So, so Ryan, um, talking about your YouTube channel, how do you decide, decide to create a YouTube channel? Because 
it's another way to 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 create something to tell a story and to know people right mm -hmm. uh, so when do you decide to create a youtube channel uh why well, i started it really really quickly after uh shooting film because like i said earlier like i knew how to do video so i already yeah. knew that i was going to be able to do the editing and everything like that but um, when I first started, I was I made this video of me like unboxing the Mamiya 645 and then just talking about why I'm getting in, into film. And at the time, I just said it was going to be about my my film journey, like my process, showing you everything that I learn and everything that I do. And it's still that I'm still showing like um, everything that's going on and all the mistakes that I make and kind of doing like informative stuff, but um, it mostly kicked off when I started to do the Analog Artisans episodes yeah. and things like that. And I mostly did that series because I thought that YouTube was lacking in that, spe specifically film photography. Um, most of it was just like walking around, taking pictures. <laughs> and I'm not really... I myself, I'm not that interesting, so I figured I would go out to <laughs> interview other more interesting people, and it was more to practice portraiture as well because I wasn't getting like any paid gigs or anything like that, so I figured I'd reach out to these people, um, practice my portraits, make a video on them, and then make it into a little documentary on the work that they make, and... Uh, that's what I enjoy the most out of the channel now. And I just want to keep making those and keep getting like more interesting and more influential people with uh, more um, pronounced ideas on anything that's uh, remotely interesting to me. Since Brian, since you uh, started the series of like analog artisans, how that changed the the way you see or approach people because i i know you you are now like maybe i i'm i'm assuming this because you're walking down the street that that's an interesting person that maybe have, have a great uh that i don't know that man maybe has a great background story how 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 that changed the way you you see people on the streets yeah it's just it's really just change exactly like you said like you can see pretty much anybody walking down the street and every single one of them is going to have a story to tell oh, yeah. and that's one of the things i don't really enjoy about street photography is that people and i i get that people like street photography and like i see a lot of great pictures with street photography but it's a little too impersonal f for me i just like I would rather narrow it down and focus on one person than just going around blasting 50 photos of just random people. And mm -hmm. when I like find people for these, uh, for these episodes, I mostly find them like online if they're like a painter or an artist, but that really changed, um, a couple episodes ago when I met, uh, Carol, who was a photographer and I, I was just in this small town and I came across him just sitting on his back porch and we just like started talking and everything. And it turns out he was a photographer and he had a medium format camera and he had all these dark room prints and just that chance encounter turned into a whole episode on him and how he used to be a photographer. And that kind of opened me up to the idea that literally just anyone around me could be, um, a person of interest or a person that has a story to tell. And yeah, it, it kind of opened my eyes and showed me that I could get and learn from pretty much anyone that I come across. Yeah. And actually your last video is, uh, well, not only your last video, but I think that you have that, um, you have that opportunity to know people because of photography, right? Because maybe if you don't have a camera, maybe you you don't this you don't do, you don't this for for a life. Maybe you you maybe you passed in the street and you will never meet that people. So 
how many people and how many persons do you know since photography and how that changed you? Because I think the all the background stories and all that, all the stuff maybe change your way, change the way you you see life or maybe something in specific in your life. Yeah, every time that I do an episode, it doesn't matter if I meet with a photographer or a painter or an artist or a drum maker. They're mm -hmm. always they're always going to say something that either resonates with me or teaches me something. And when I was talking to Mary, my girlfriend's grandmother in the last episode, um, she, at first she was like, I don't have anything interesting to say. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I don't think that I have any wise advice, but throughout talking to her, it's like I learned so many things about her. And then I learned just how to navigate my own life. And that's pretty much what I'm looking for in these conversations. I just want to talk with people and learn about them, but not only learn about myself in the process. And I think that's the beauty of all of it. You can learn something from anyone. It doesn't matter how smart, educated, how much they know about one thing. Everyone has their own uh, sage advice or wisdom, even yeah. if it's not what you hear like on social media or hear every day from a uh, social media influencer like a Gary V or something. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Brian, so I know this is a a a hard job. I, I know you you're used to it because of wedding uh, videos, but. Do you do, do everything by yourself? I mean, like, is it's mixing a an interview, getting to know uh, people, uh, record the video, make the the Portrait. photos. Uh, how how is it? Is are you a, a one man band or or you have a, I, any help? Uh, I am at the moment, and I don't know if I'll ever change that because the times that I have had someone help me out either something not something doesn't always go wrong but i just i like to be in control of everything and if okay. i'm going to if i'm going to be like if i'm going to make a mistake i just want it to fall back on me and not somebody else because mm -hmm. yeah. if someone else does make a mistake while they're working with me it's because i didn't tell them what to do or tell them where to be or how to do it So, yeah, I like working alone. I like um, going out and shooting alone because if I'm shooting pictures with someone, I'm always thinking, like, are they doing okay? Like, are they are they bored? Are they going to get bored with me setting up this four by five shot for 30 minutes? So, yeah, and that kind of goes back to sh shooting weddings. Like, I before I met my uh, friend Josh, I would shoot weddings. I shot, like, four or five weddings alone. And I edit alone and did everything myself. So I'm pretty used to that. And right now it's just the easiest way to work for me is because if I'm going to mess up, it's going to be on me. And if I'm going to do well and progress, then that's on me as well. It's not on somebody else. Yeah. 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 I get you. And also when making portraits, it is, it is different when, when anyone else is in the room. I mean, it's it's a different process. I, I, I get you on that, too. Yeah, when I was taking uh, the portraits of Mary in the last episode, um, her, uh, I guess, son-in-law was there. And mm. uh, I was like, I was kind of caught off guard, but he was just like fixing something at her house. And I was just like waiting for him to leave because I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if I, I want to like start this right now or what, yeah. but... I just like, I set up the camera and he eventually was just like, oh, okay, I'm going to leave. And I was like, okay, that's good. So now we're just, we can focus on this and I don't have to focus about an audience uh, critiquing me in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan, how do you, how is for you com to combine video and analog, analog photography for, for one video? Why? Which is the process? When do you decide this is the photo that I want to to put in the video? Or maybe before all that, and even uh, doing the interview, you are thinking on one portrait in a specific. 
and you will do the video around that portrait. How, how, which is the process? That, that kind of changes with everything, but that also like pretty much all this goes back to making wedding videos, which is weird because you wouldn't think that that would play such a, a key role. But even when I'm shooting a wedding and everything, I'm always thinking about how the edit's going to be in my head and like when this certain part's going to be. And when I'm doing the interview, I'm always just, I'm looking, I leave the questions open ended a lot and I just like kind of let them rattle off their thoughts because I already know that I'm going to be chopping down everything that they say and just picking out the key parts. And once I hear or see something that they do, um, then we can kind of base the feel of the portraits off what they talked about or what they said. Okay. So I, I wanted to keep Mary's specifically. I wanted to do like serious ones and playful ones, like looking off camera and looking at the camera and smiling. Not, not only because she was talking about funny things and serious things, but because I was planning on like giving prints to all her uh, kids mm. and they're not going to want like a super serious, like look into the side portrait of their, their grandma. They, they want to yeah. see her smiling. They want to see her looking at the camera. So um, that's kind of how I centered the portraits of her around. And two, she's not uh, the most, uh, obviously a lot of people aren't that comfortable in front of a camera, but she wasn't the most comfortable. So um, doing the interview beforehand kind of loosens them up and um, yeah. also using the four by five as well. That definitely helps because you're not just snapping off a thousand different portraits of someone. So yeah, most, most of the time you're just prepping for one shot. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Brian, do you think it, it is harder to, to photograph uh, strangers or, or people you know or people that are, are kind of yep. attached to you yeah I would I honestly think people that you know because yeah <laughs> and I, I don't take that many pictures of like my family or I mean I take pictures of my girlfriend Emma a lot because she's like right there and if I need to test a camera or something I'm just like hey like let's do this right now <laughs> but yeah uh, Okay, well, I don't like snap at her because she does get mad at me when I snap at her. But, uh, be careful, be careful. So, yeah, like str photographing strangers, it's just nice to... Um, I feel like when you photograph someone you know, you're subconsciously doing things and posing them in a certain way that yeah. makes them look their best. I don't know if that makes sense, but when I meet yeah. a stranger, I'm just acting off instinct and I don't know like what their best side is. I don't know how they like to stand or pose or whatever they want to do in photos. And I think when it's open-ended like that and when you're just going off your gut and um, just telling because most of the time when I take a portrait of a stranger, I'm just like, uh, I'm just like either sit or stand and just like, Do your, do your own thing. I don't want to like pose anyone in a certain way to yeah. elicit a different type of emotion. And that might change um, as I get older and more experienced, but, or if the project that I'm working on has a certain idea or theme, but right now I just want people to uh, be exactly as they are and act really normal and not really put on a show for anyone. Yeah, I think I think uh, making portraits of of strangers, we always want to capture that one thing that caught us or caught caught our eye when when we saw them passing by. I think it's mm -hmm. like like that. Don't don't be any any anybody else. Just be the one that was walking down the street, and that's right. hard to 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 man maintain when you have a, a a lot of prep time with a a four by five saying it, it is a, a challenge yeah and that's that's something i want to get better at as well because obviously a lot of my portraits fo are focused around people and their cars because that's what the project is but mm -hmm. i definitely want to get better about and i want to start an, a new project where i'm 
just picking people that are interesting and they either just have an interesting costume or their face looks interesting or they just look like an interesting person. I want to be able to get out of that whole, um, the classic car is like the conversation starter and yeah. focus more on just taking portraits of interesting people, not interesting people with a classic car. Yeah. And also you have in, in your YouTube channel, you have uh, not only this, uh, this series, the analog artisans, well, you have another part that is uh, you talking about photographers you like, mm -hmm. you're talking about, uh, I don't know, gear, right, of course, but talking about photographers you like and um, that kind of stuff, which, which one are the most important photographers for you? that influence your work um obviously it's it's gonna be like alex soth um joel sternfeld like brian scumont people that use large format and i don't lately um like the next video that i'm putting out i'm gonna be kind of talking about people that people that influence me now that use like digital and just really inexpensive cameras that make really wonderful work because I have three cameras right now. I have a four by five, I have the Pentax and then I have digital. And when I walk around with that, it just seems like it's too much and I'm second guessing everything. And I like when I shoot a wedding on video, I have one camera and one lens. I just use a 35 millimeter lens, this lens that I'm using right now. And it's just so much easier that way where I don't have to do calculations in my head about what lens or what camera I want to use. So I want to talk um, in this next video about people that do use digital and um, because I myself, I want to get more on the digital and maybe four by five realm because I think when I shoot medium format, I'm always kind of iffy on the results and it's really just kind of a pain to carry it around. It's a pain to scan. So, um, lately influences have, have been people that, uh, shoot on any type of camera system. But at the very beginning, when I was getting, getting into large format, it was like Brian Scootmont and Alex Soth, Joel Sternfeld and Scootmont specifically because he just does amazing portraits on large format. And some of the portraits that he gets, it, they just look like something that um, I've never seen before. And that's what drew me to 4x5. And uh, even like Joel Sternfeld, I want to get more, um, I want to get better about just taking um, more landscape type photos and not uh, shooting wide open all the time on portraits and posing people in a certain way and getting the background and getting a little bit more of their environment, things like that. But, um, and of course like Alex Soth and all his projects that he shoots on large format and, and the fact that he did that, um, sleeping by the Mississippi all along the Mississippi river. That's kind of where I'm from since I'm right in the middle in St. Louis. So that kind of, um, influenced me a lot because he took portraits of people that I can kind of relate to and, people that are kind of from the same region as me. Yeah, great. Oh, talk, talking about um, misery, is it, is it hard to, to approach people to, to, to photograph or, or, or is, are the people are more, more open in, in um, that way? Well, I haven't really been to, uh, along this project, I've mostly stuck to Missouri and Illinois. So, I don't have that much experience with asking people from different regions, but from my experience, and this changes <laughs> region to region, I'm sure, but um, I've had very few instances where people get weirded out or mad or angry or like coming out with their gun or anything like that. Because, <laughs> oh I mean, 95% of the time I am going up to their door and knocking on it and asking them for a portrait. So I've had a lot of people comment saying, if you did that here, you would get beat up, you would get harassed, you would get shot. But um, I am going to Washington um, late next month, and I intend to 
knock on some doors there. So I guess we're, <laughs> we're going to see if the Northwest is as nice as the Midwest, but I haven't had any problems, but it changes with uh, region to region, country to country, I'm sure. So, yeah. so my, for my understanding, the, the process that you do for uh, choosing maybe uh, a person or maybe some character, it's it's sort of random. You're all driving down the street and you look something and you go to the door and knock, knock the door. That's the process. Yeah. Yeah, so if I see it, it's changed lately. At the very beginning, I would just drive around. I would see a car, and I wouldn't even think about what the person potentially looks like. I would just go knock on the door and ask them. And once you do that a couple, 50, 100 times, you get a lot of the, of the same people, which is mostly white male, 40 to 60 years old, who is <laughs> incredibly boring looking. So I'm like, sometimes now when I go and see a car, I like, and this might sound creepy or weird, but I like take a couple laps around and I'm like looking for clues as to what type of person they might be because I don't want to get up there, knock on the door. And then a 50 year old average looking white dude answers it. I'm just like, Hey, uh, sorry. I just, I got <laughs> never go mind. To my, yeah. <laughs> but uh, luckily I've, I, I guess I go to regions that, uh, have a certain character or you kind of know who, who or what they might look like based on the car that's in their driveway. Um, <laughs> lately I don't like like perfectly clean, pristine looking cars. Um, the type of car that I want is something that's a little bit older, maybe a little bit rusted, but um, I do in the, when the book comes out and when the project's done, I do want to have like a juxtaposition between people with nicer cars and then people with mm -hmm. uh, older classic cars. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. It's kind of hard to, um, cause you want to be specific, but you, you don't want to be too specific cause then you're just going to be driving around, not finding anyone because you're afraid that they're going to be just average. And mm -hmm. I don't want, I don't want that to happen because then I won't be taking any pictures of anyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that sounds, uh, kind of, kind of, kind of an, an easy process. I mean, it's not easy to step on the door outside the door of somebody and knock for a picture. It's not easy, but mm -hmm. Comparing here in Mexico City, yeah, you could get shot, beaten, or, or I don't know, a dog beat you or something like that. And that changes uh, street by street. I mean, you can find a, one kind person in one street, then another block. There's a guy you don't want to mess with. And yeah. I've, it's to be so hard. I haven't had, I've only had a couple, I've only really had one kind of bad encounter and that's it it had nothing to do with a car i was like i was feeling i was like i'm gonna start this new project and just it's just gonna be strangers and this was a couple months ago and this kind of like screwed up my psyche a little bit for a while because okay. of, the, of this encounter but um i i think the picture's still on my instagram i'm not sure but um it's a picture of a gentleman and he's wearing all camo and he looks perfectly normal. He looks like a nice guy, someone you would like have a beer with. But okay. I saw him standing on the corner of this apartment building and I saw that he was in, in all camo and I was like, that would make for a really interesting portrait. So I parked and I got out and I told him what I was doing. This was in Dupo, Illinois, which is like 15 minutes to the east. And um, I was like, I'm taking photos of people of Dupo and just Dupo in general, can I get a portrait of you? And this guy proceeds to tell me about how he just got back from prison and he was in prison for seven years on a drug charge. And he's like, they call his nickname was possum because he was in a bar and he threw a possum on someone and the possum was like eating this guy's face. Damn. And 
about this about this time my heart was about to beat out of my chest but i was putting on a brave face and staying calm and he started talking about his friends down the street who have guns and ak-47s if we want to make the portrait really interesting and about, about that time i was just like i was like hey if if you're because he was worried about me posting the picture and people like seeing him online and I was like, if you're worried about that, I can just leave. It's no big deal. Like <laughs> I was trying to get out of there, but he, he agreed to the portrait and, uh, I ended up taking it and he looks like a super nice guy, but, uh, that kind of messed with me for a while because I was in the back of my head, um, for a couple months after that, I was like, is this guy going to be like that guy? Or is he going to be like the ni other 99% that are perfectly fine? And uh, still kind of dealing with that to this day, but uh, yeah. That's a, a risky, a risky story. Yeah. But a risky photograph, actually. But no, well, I will be very, very worried also because that's yeah. very risky and I don't know. <laughs> David, you'll, you'll be locked in your room for yeah. three weeks or something like that yeah right. thinking about the possum and all that stuff <laughs> thinking about the possum <laughs> yeah. yeah so brian the how is the the photography scene in missouri you are you just you, you see more photographers like you in in the in missouri taking uh film photograph um maybe doing a, maybe similar stuff like you or are you um, the only one with a four by five in your backpack? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't met too many, but I know that they're out there and I, I just need to be better about, uh, communicating with them and, uh, reaching out to them. But I did meet up with, uh, one guy, his name was Nick and he shoots like, um, he shoots four by five and does a lot of Polaroid stuff. And I, he was in a, a video that I did previously, but yeah, I definitely, I want to, definitely want to connect with uh, other people around here because it does get kind of um, not boring, but um, sometimes you do want to go out with someone and just like explore a different area or something like that. So that's something that I have been thinking about a, a lot lately because sometimes it does get tiresome and boring just to go out and uh, do everything on your own and just explore an area on your own. So. Yeah, it, it it feels like like you you having that companion. It, it's like I don't know, even you feel like safer. I think like exploring right. uh, uh, different areas that you don't really know. Mm -hmm. It could be yeah. easier. Yeah, there's a couple there's a couple places where a um, couple places around St. Louis where I'm just like I'm not afraid to go because I don't know how safe compared to where you guys live, but St. Louis is like number one or two or three and murders all the time. So, um, when you're walking around, you're not, you don't feel like unsafe, but it, it would just be a lot better if there was someone to have your back just to, cause I'm more worried about the gear than anything else because I have a four by five in my bag and a medium format and digital. And yeah, it's just, if someone's there to back you up, you just feel a lot safer. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. So uh, uh, talking about gear, Brian, do you, do you only have one four by five? It's is it the the Intrepid, right? No, I use a uh, Chamonix forty five okay. N one. It's the it's the the first camera that they came out with. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles. It's super simple, but I did um, I do have that. That's my only four by five at the moment. But okay, I started out with an Intrepid, and I've I've talked a lot about that on the channel and stuff and it's just not the camera for me it's a perfectly fine camera if you want to like test out four by five but for the portraits that i do i just had to have something that's a little more stable and mm. a little more refined but i've used intrepids and chamonix and speed graphics yeah. and they're they all have um certain aspects that are that benefit one over the, over the other. But for me right now, the Chamonix is the only camera that I'm like, I don't see myself parting with that ever because it's just so well built and 
it just does exactly what I need it to do. And it's super light and I don't have to worry about it falling apart or, um, anything happening to it. Yeah. And talking about another cameras that we saw you had in your channel, uh, which format do you like the most the four by five or six by seven? Four by five is every time that I, I get every time that I develop the photos and look, look at them, I'm like, it's exactly what I want. And that's mm -hmm. what I was kind of talking about with 120. It's like, once you shoot four by five and then you kind of see what that's all about and you can see what it can do, it kind of leaves you just wanting more with medium format. So I'm kind of in between right now on what I want to do. If I want to like ditch medium format altogether and just try to get the same look with digital, I'm kind of experimenting that with that right now, but, um, it's nice to just be able to carry around the Pentax and like travel with it and just put it in your bag or just carry it around all day and you can st still get really good images out of it. But, um, if I had to choose one format for sure, it, it, de it would definitely be four by five. Have, have you tried, uh, digital medium format, uh, like the, the Fuji, I don't know if, if the GFX, I think. Yeah, I've yeah. I've never I've thought about um, like renting one of those and seeing what it's all about, but yeah, I would be m way more inclined to purchase one of those if it could do the video that I need as well. Because oh, yeah, with weddings and stuff, I shoot like 4K, and the the camera that I use right now it's 4K 10 bit. It does all the bells and whistles with video and. Uh, For photo, it's 24 megapixels, which is good. And then I use it for scanning as well. So it does like a high resolution mode where you can get um, super detailed scans with it with a macro lens. So if there was a camera out there that shot um, medium format digital and then 4K and allowed me to scan as well, I would probably buy that. But uh, right now they don't make that. So I, I would be interested in seeing how it compares to just a regular full frame digital, but um little too expensive for me at the moment to oh yeah even to even rent yeah. so <laughs> yeah and so i know that you uh you love four by five and we understand that <laughs> but do what the uh, camera do you prefer the pentax on or mamilla because you had both of them um for me probably the pentax because it's just a lot it looks like a normal camera it's a lot easier to carry around <laughs> um, <laughs> i bought i bought the rz because willem used the rz and i was like <laughs> i want to i want to take pictures like that and i look back now and i'm like i i would never like carry that thing around anymore um but the pentax like i have the i don't have the the wood grip i sold that but i i just have like a 3d printed um mm, right hand yeah. grip Yeah. And it's just so easy to carry around and everyone talks about it being heavy, but, um, I don't really mind it. Um, it's a lot just more ergonomic and easier to carry. So definitely would choose the Pentax and I just like the look of the 105. It's like a, a magical lens and everyone talks about it and there's a reason why everyone talks about it because it looks really good. So yeah, it, the, the, The images you, you can get from the Pentax and, and that lens are just amazing. So the one thing we haven't talked about, it is film stock. Which is your, your favorite film stock for, for portraits? I really like, I've only, for color, I've pretty much only shot Portra 160. And I know everyone's in love with Portra 400. 400, yeah. <laughs> I shot that one time and... It was probably because I was brand new to photography and it was a long time ago, but I shot it once and it turned out like garbage. So I was like, <laughs> I'm never shooting Portra 400 ever again. So I've only shot Portra 160 for color. I mean, I've, I've messed around with like Ektar and things like that and slide yeah. film. I really like slide film, but it's just the latitude and it's a little too contrasty for me. Yeah. So 
Yeah. But uh, Portra 160 has been my go-to. It's just, it's more subtle with colors. Um, the contrast isn't as strong. And it's just, I, I don't like too much grain in, in my photos. So uh, the 160 is really nice. But um, for black and white, I mostly stick with T-Max 100. And I have, I shoot a, quite a bit HP5 as well, like for Mary's video. Um, I knew that she was like going to be inside mostly, yeah. so I shot HP5 for that just because it's uh, the ISO is a little bit higher and don't have to worry about such low shutter speeds. But T Max 100, I love um, every time that I shoot it. I'm just happy with what I get. It's super easy to develop, um, super low grain. Um, it prints really well on in the dark room. And yeah, it just works really well for me. So I'm trying my best to stick to those two stocks for the foreseeable future, just so I can have a more consistent look with everything. And I think that will, uh, be, that will suit me pretty well. Perfect. And Ryan, before starting with the last part of the interview, there is a, a little game called uh, one phrase, one photo. I want to ask you something about your lens because you have a video about your lens, the the Zenotar. Oh, se fue. Oh, you're back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened, but uh, the question was about your your lens. Yes. And you have a video about the, the Zenotar, the planners, and and mm -hmm. all that stuff on your four by five camera what is the main thing that you choose for a lens maybe their character or what are you looking in a lens for a for a portrait for example um well when i started looking at the portraits of brian scootman i knew that he had i knew that he was probably using a lens that had was pretty fast like a 2.8 or a 3.5 but if you get too involved in that you'll go just go down a rabbit hole and i really went down a <laughs> rabbit hole when i was uh first getting into large format because i wanted the sh most shallow depth of field imaginable i wanted the dreamy bokeh and everything yeah <laughs> and i bought the speed graphic i bought like an a bull lens a 2.5 lens And you can get obsessed with that and you kind of miss the whole fact of why his portraits are great to begin with. And it's because it's because the posing, the lighting, it's the people that he photographs. It's not because he has a fast lens, but I just wanted yeah. a lens that was a little bit wider than a normal portrait lens. because a lot of people might use like a for for four by five, they might use like a 180 or a 210 which is like a 50 or like a 75 or an 80. Yeah. And I just feel like that's a little too far away. It's not as intimate. So I like to be a little bit closer. And I did use the Zenitar 150 for a while and I got super lucky when I found that lens because I found it for a, a steal because um, it can sell for two, three, four, five thousand dollars. Yeah. But um, I wanted to find something that was a little bit more because that would have certain char characteristics that I didn't like. Uh, it had some like weird flaring and some mm. friend like purple fringing that you would see just because it's not going to be like a perfect lens, like a more modern lens. But I switched over to a Carl Zeiss lens and then I actually came across a Zenitar 135 lens that is in like a a newer shutter and it has a faster shutter speed because obviously when you're shooting outside and cloudy or even well sunny or even cloudy situations you need a fast sh shutter speed if you're going to shoot wide open so i settled on the zenitar and it's worked perfectly for what i do um i really like to separate the subject and we when you use movements and everything uh, combined with a faster lens, you can really get a look that you can't really get with anything else. Because even when, if you pose someone and you're taking like a side portrait at an angle, if you shoot super wide open on a Pentax, you're going to get one eye in focus and the other <laughs> eye is not going to be in focus. So yeah. 
That's the beauty of large format is you can use a little bit of swing, get both eyes in focus, and you get a look that you can't replicate anywhere else. And that's what I, that's what I love the most about about four by five is you can't replicate that unless you want to like take it into Photoshop and uh, change it digitally and yeah. alter it mm -hmm. that way. Yeah, that's why the the four by five always looked to me like I don't know this. 3D rendered uh, holographic feeling on, on the pictures. It, it is great. It is great. Right. <laughs> so, Ryan, we will start with the last part of the interview. It's it's a game. I sure, I'm sure that you saw that on the other videos that you saw about us. So mm -hmm. it's it's called one one uh, una foto una frase in español. One photo one phrase. It's not uh, a phrase. A phrase you can say anything about it. Uh, maybe an end of the, or I don't know, any thought that you have about these photos. So let's start with the first one. That is this one. Oh, that, well, the guy on the left is actually the guy that I shoot uh, wedding videos with. That's Josh. Oh, um, that's Josh. Nice, nice to meet yeah. you, Josh. <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you, Josh. <laughs> so <laughs> I was, uh, that was like the second or third um, Analog Artisans episode, but um, that's kind of when I was trying to figure out like the concept and the, um, the idea behind everything. And I didn't really have anyone to <clears throat> photograph or interview at the time. So, uh, I, he's a musician, he's in a band and he has a lot of stories to tell and kind of insights on, uh, making music and writing songs and things like that. And, um, yeah, photographed him in the house that he was living in. And that's uh, Sinistil. You can tell by the nice halations exactly. on, the, on the on the blinds. But yeah, that's uh, that's Josh. I was about to ask him that is maybe maybe it's a Sinistil film because all the glow, red glow, right? Red glow. <clears throat> so this is the next one. Is this one? Yeah. So that's when I had the RZ. Um, you can tell obviously by how close uh, yeah. it is. <laughs> That's one thing I, so there's two things I like about the RZ and it's the close focusing because with the Pentax, you have to have extension tubes, mm -hmm. which is kind mm -hmm. of a pain. And then also the, uh, switchable backs is nice to have, but, uh, yeah, my mom, she, um, we've always, we've had horses our, my whole life. Um, we used to go on trail rides and we had five horses at a time and my mom lives out uh, kind of in the country. She has like 20 acres and she takes care of other people's horses now. And this was actually, I believe this is our horse that we have. Uh, his name's Rusty, but yeah, I was just going around taking photos of, uh, of them on black and white, just practicing. I used to practice a lot on horses and sure. just wanted to get a, a super close shot and it turned out really well. Um, I, that's probably one of my favorite horse pictures that I've I've taken. Yeah, actually, in that series, uh, when, in that post that you did on Instagram, the last photo is the horse laying in the ground. Mm -hmm. I think that's my favorite. I, I don't pick that pick that because uh, I think this was the your favorite, but also the other one when the horse is laying around with the balls yeah. in the air. It's it's amazing. I love it. That I love that photo. <laughs> So this is the next, another portrait. So this is uh, JD. Um, he's a boot maker and uh, I met him. I think I just Googled like handmade, um, handmade St. Louis and his website <laughs> popped up cause he makes handmade boots and he was really interesting. Uh, he talked a lot about, uh, photography and he had a speed graphic and he actually had it inside his studio where he makes boots and he would go around and he talked about all the travels that he used to do, uh, going around taking four by five shots and, uh, taking portraits. He had a Polaroid shot of his, uh, grandmother and it was just super interesting talking to him, but yeah, he makes, uh, incredibly well-made boots and, uh, it's just, crazy to see the amount of work that goes into something like that because you're so used to just seeing something on yeah. a manu manufacturing line where they're just machines are doing it. So it was super interesting to see him make everything by hand. 
Yeah, exactly. The next one is, uh, I read the description on your post and you said that um, you were in your car in a, in a red light and you saw that hat and that man, right? And that's, yeah. that's the reason you approached to him. Mm -hmm. So that's, this guy, his name's Carl and he was actually, so I was driving around a, uh, sorry, my, my headset just told me low battery, but, uh, oh. <laughs> I was driving around this. So there's a Sonic drive-in, um, and every Friday they do like a car show and I was driving around there because I thought it would be a good, good idea to try to see like people for the project. If there's anyone interesting, uh, might approach them and like give them a card or something and tell them, but, um, I was leaving that parking lot and I saw Carl sitting on his porch. Um, and I, I did see his hat. It was, and his shirt's really colorful, but I chose to shoot it in black and white because that's the only thing I had at the time. And yeah, I just parked and I approached him and I was like, I really like your sweater and I like the way that your hat looked. I was just sitting, um, at, at a red light and saw you. And he was uh, super nice, and I went to get the camera, and then obviously he started asking questions about everything, and that's probably one of my favorite portraits. Um, I was actually just talk to, talking to my girlfriend, Emma, and she said that that's her favorite portrait. So um, kind of wish that I shot it in color because the, the project that I do want to do about just strangers and portraits, I want that to be in all color. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this, but it's actually sitting behind me right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah, but that's yeah. him. It's him, yeah. That's Carl. Amazing. Is that, that a, a darkroom print or, or a digital um, print? No, but I have the, I have the darkroom print somewhere, but this is a digital print. Okay. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Uh, but the, the darkroom print was actually kind of tough for me because the the uh, the building behind him is really bright. Okay. So it was kind of hard to. Uh, I'm still pretty new to the darkroom, so it was kind of hard for to to, to like, mask it with with yeah, your to, your hand. To dodge yeah. and burn everything. Yeah. So I do have a darkroom print, but it's a, it looks a lot different compared to that. <laughs> yeah. I went to show the the one that with of the horse that I told you. <laughs> this one. Yes. Yeah, I love. Yeah. I love this you do, you don't see horses in in that position exactly. that often. Exactly yeah. that one. Yeah, it's it's tough because every time every time that they're down, rolling around or just like sitting, anytime yeah. you you get close, they just hop up. So. Um, yeah, he was doing that right in front of me and I just, that was actually the last shot of the roll. So I was just like, if, if it sucks, it sucks, but it turned out really well. Yeah. Amazing. The next one is this one, this portrait. So that was actually, he was like the second person for the project that I photographed. Um, his name is Ken and I saw his car just sitting in the driveway and, um, Obviously, this was uh, this is actually kind of when I first got the Pentax as well. So I was pretty excited about using that for the project. But um, I shot a couple on four by five of just himself, and then um, I saw his wife. Uh, I can't remember her name, but she came out and she was kind of asking questions about everything. And I was like, "Do you guys want to get a picture together?" And had them pose, and uh, it was with the Pentax and. Um, one of my last videos, I just, um, I had his print for like a year just sitting in my closet and I don't know why I never like went over there and gave it to him. But, um, one of the last videos that I put out, I finally gave him that print and, uh, it was funny because he was cutting grass and I was like, do you remember me? He's like, and then I got closer and I'm like, I was the guy with the, the wood field <laughs> camera. And he's like, oh yeah. Okay. And he finally remembered me, but. Yeah, it's uh, I really like that one, and I always wanted to hang it up on my wall, but I know people would just ask me like, "Oh, is that like your grandparents?" Or, yeah, <laughs> and I saw so I never hung it up. 
and the last one yeah. is this this photo yeah so that's last. yeah um yeah that's mary i really love that portrait um like i said with large format that's the beauty of like swing and using movements and shooting wide open it just has that really specific look but yep. uh she looks kind of she looks kind of angry in that photo and that's like <laughs> not the way that she is so uh, i printed that one for myself in the dark room and uh it's actually sitting in the other room i printed a 16 by 20 of that one but uh oh wow yeah i've only done a couple 16 by 20s and it's an incredible amount of work because my enlarger is in my workroom in my basement and the ceiling is pretty low so i have to take the enlarger off what i have it on and set it down on the ground yeah and that thing <laughs> that thing weighs like 75 pounds so every time that i do it i'm just like sweating and there's like blood sweat and tears dripping all over the place so if i ever sell a 16 by 20 darkroom print i can say that blood sweat and tears went into into this because there's probably some in the developer <laughs> well, that's that that yeah. was the last one <laughs> so you didn't have to to do any dodging and burning with that or or, or are you running um, around the 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 paper to <laughs> yeah w with 16 i i didn't do anything to that and it turned out okay um okay i'm still getting used to um doing 16 by 20s because they're just so large but um I'm still tr I'm having a little bit of trouble like getting the exposures down because when you go from eight by ten to sixteen by twenty, supposedly you're supposed to double the exposure time. Yeah, because so, of the of the distance from the light source. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that, and it was a little bit overexposed, but mm. um, I didn't want to waste another sheet of paper doing another one. So <laughs> I was just like, it's fine um, if someone wants to. <laughs> If someone wants to buy a 16 by 20, I'm going to have to charge a lot of money because I'm going to be wasting a lot of paper trying to get the exposure right and everything. Yeah. So, Brian, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for this interview, this chat, actually, because we know you from your videos, but it's, it's fantastic to know you, not in person, of course, but in this right. way directly. So thank you very much, Ryan. Um, please keep doing the, the great work. Your channel is one of a kind because you have this combination of documentary style with photo and video. So that's amazing. Now you can get to know a lot of interesting people. Thanks. I appreciate yeah. that. It's, ni it's nice to hear because um, you can get like, and I'm not saying like YouTube comments are bad or anything, but you can get like, a hundred like good jobs on YouTube and it it doesn't feel the same as when someone like tells you face to face or like in person or like yeah. through audio so I appreciate that a lot yeah thanks thanks again Brian for your time and it is one of the most inspiring channels it, it, it yeah. when we have uh, guests that I mean all guests we have we, we admire and we appreciate uh, the them sharing that thing, uh, their time and their knowledge and experience in, in, in YouTube channels. Uh, but the, the one channel that that makes you want to stop the video, grab your camera and get out on the streets and, and make portraits are the most uh, the ones that we most uh, uh, love and appreciate. And your channel is one of those. Good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you can you can get that because I, I mean, I get that from other channels. So it's yeah. like yeah. when I, like making the videos are great and everything, but yeah, there's nothing better than just like sitting down and then watching someone on YouTube and then getting inspired and going out to shoot and doing your own thing. So I'm glad that my channel can do that for you guys. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate the, the sentiment and having me on here and everything. So thanks, Brian. If you want to come one day to Mexico City and do a, a series about analog artisans right here. <laughs> That yeah, is, you should. I don't know. I, I'm, my girlfriend's family is going to Mexico in January, so I'm going to see. It's usually a family trip, but I'm going to see if I can like sneak in and uh, go down to Mexico <laughs> with them. But I don't know if they're going to Mexico City, but maybe. Okay, don't future. worry. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs>
Yeah, Brian, you should. Uh, even if if it's if it's not Mexico City, you will have a amazing places to shoot portraits in, in yeah. all, all around the country. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely want to travel more. Um, like I said, I'm like I'm going to Washington, but I definitely want to get to a more uh, culture culturally diverse section of the world yeah. and just see what see what that's like because i've been to mexico once but it was for a wedding and stuff so i didn't really have much time to explore but yeah i definitely want to go to mexico and see what europe's about and places like that and just meet people of all kinds of different diverse cultures perfect ryan yeah just get ready for extreme weather because we have a <laughs> very hot days and then very cold cold days even Not rainy sometimes or rainy days in, in one day you can get all all kind of weather so <laughs> get ready yeah for that. I, i'm used to that because missouri we get snow we get tornadoes we get earthquakes <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah so we, we have it all here but uh yeah that would definitely be interesting <laughs> well thank you ryan thank you for your time and please uh, stick around and this uh, interview will be ready for the I think the second week of October. So um, I will let you know and I will post everything on Instagram. So can I, can we use your photos yeah. that we show right now? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks again, Brian, for, for being here and for your YouTube channel. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I look forward to uh, many more videos that you guys have. And, um, Try try to do a lot more in English because uh, yeah, I really want to follow along and uh, <laughs> see what you guys are all about. So, I think this yeah this, this season is the one with most. Uh, we have we only had uh, I think one one guest in in Spanish in two, this right now two. two two guests yeah the rest of the guests are are in English. Uh, girl, uh, Karim from for Germany yeah we have a lot of English speakers right now. So. Yeah, when I, I watched a little bit of Ribs' uh, video, and I did it without captions at first, because I, I think you guys, it has like auto-generated captions, which is nice, yeah. but yeah. I watched without the captions for a little bit, and I was trying to guess what you guys were talking about, and I would hear like <laughs> every once in a while something like camera or something like that, <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, I need the captions, I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not cultured. <laughs> Uh, no, it, it, you picked a, a hard one because, I mean, we 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 speak like Spanish with with a very Mexican uh, approach, and and Reeves is like a uh, Dominican. Dominican approach, but born and raised in New York. Uh, yeah. uh, so <laughs> it was you you picked a hard one to to catch Spanish. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to take a peek at some of the other ones. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Well, thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. And let me stop recording this one.